Welcome to our discussion on developing a charitable giving strategy. I'm Todd Eckler, Executive Director of Fiduciary Trust Charitable, a sponsor of flexible, advisor-managed, donor-advised funds. The past 18 months have been a challenging time for individuals, families, and nonprofits around the world as the COVID pandemic has unfolded. Fortunately, the generosity of countless individuals and entities has helped keep many of these nonprofits operating during this difficult time, some of which have been providing critical services to those most impacted by the pandemic. We hope today's webcast will help funders focus and evolve their charitable giving strategies to further enhance the impact of their charitable grants. Whether you're an individual or a grant-making foundation, fund, charity, or company, there's a common desire to achieve the greatest impact with charitable giving. However, without thinking through the objectives of your giving and taking some steps to ensure you're giving to the best organizations and structuring your gifts appropriately, your impact could fall short. Today, we're going to speak with an expert in charitable giving strategy, Betsy Brill, president of Strategic Philanthropy Limited, a leading philanthropic consulting firm she co-founded over 20 years ago. During that time, she's facilitated over $6 billion in gifts and she and her team have advised hundreds of individuals, families, and closely held businesses on their charitable giving strategies. Welcome, Betsy. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate your having me to discuss this timely and important topic. And of course, Todd, as you mentioned, we really can't begin this discussion about charitable planning without mentioning where we find ourselves today. The impact of COVID has had wide-reaching effects on philanthropy. From a redoubled effort to address health inequity, food insecurity, racial injustice, and to the shifting ways in which philanthropy is practiced, and nonprofits are now structuring and adjusting their work. And we think all of this is going to be persistent as we all address the environmental and social issues in the philanthropic world. I appreciate your having me, Todd. Thanks, Betsy. It's, we're delighted to have you here. And those are really important points you're making about the far-reaching impact of the COVID pandemic. Before we get into the approach for developing a charitable giving strategy, what do you see as some of the benefits of developing a strategy and where have you seen some go astray by not taking a disciplined approach to grant making? Taking the time to plan and really having clarity of purpose, both for your near and long-term vision, really helps you stay on track and ensures that there's continuity over time. If you miss this formative framework setting, and it compromises the confidence that you need to truly know that you're making a difference around the issues and communities that you care deeply about. I'd also say that knowing who you are as a donor and how to engage in good practice and how to best move the needle on specific issues really helps to ensure that you have partnerships with the organizations and the field, which leads directly to your success. Many donors do in fact go astray and they found themselves without a, a proper rubric that, that informs their philanthropic work that leads to them feeling overwhelmed, um, really unable to have strategic um, discussions uh, at the board table or at the committee table. And it, it challenges uh, the opportunities to make an impact. I would add finally that planning and having a philanthropic framework really provides the um, the opportunity for your successors or for the next generation to step into your philanthropy with a sense of who you are as a donor and where you're headed so that they're not left 
uh, you know, without uh, a roadmap and, and direction. So there's continuity. So let's dive into the first step, understanding giving capital. This is an important place to start as it will define how much funding is available and when. If you're the trustee or advisor for a grant-making entity or fund that's already been funded, of course, understanding the available resources is more straightforward. If you're an individual or family, it can be beneficial to work with your advisor to access your available philanthropic capital in the context of your overall wealth plan. You want to take into account your expected income and other sources of assets in future years, current level of assets and expected growth, as well as expenses and goals for transferring wealth to the next generation. There are also a number of tax considerations in terms of when and how to fund charitable causes, and so it's important to consult with your tax advisors. In some cases, this may involve the gift of highly appreciated assets or business interests we can, which can significantly benefit from advanced planning. Ultimately, you need to develop an initial plan for how much funding you'd like to commit during your lifetime, as well as bequests. Of course, the plan can be modified as conditions change or just different charitable causes or funding opportunities arise. Betsy, do you have any further thoughts on this front? I actually do, but I really like to start with putting an exclamation point, Todd, on, on what you just said which is that, um, you know, giving capital is not merely informed by the most effective and efficient tax strategies, Um, but it's also informed by how much you want to give now versus later. And I think that's a really important point for all donors to reflect on. What we're seeing is that, that many donors today are digging deep now, and they've, they've set a spend-down strategy so that actually the vehicle they've created or will be creating has a time horizon so that they can, what I might say, front-load uh, their giving today or over the next 10 to, to 15 years. Now that, that clearly is a... Is a critical thing to think about in terms of what timing you want to give during your lifetime or or beyond your lifetime. Both impacts your amount of giving today, but also how you engage other family members and prepare next generation for philanthropic activities in different, in different ways. Um, so if we uh, kind of go back to the framework um, in the next step, uh, once you have a good understanding of the capital available, The next stage is articulating your vision. Betsy, you want to take us through that one? Absolutely. So this is sort of the, uh, the, you know, the base of your, your philanthropic house that that's more cement flooring. Uh, and this is where you really take time to articulate your motivations and goals and, and your values. Um, but first, looking at what what is driving you to be philanthropic? Do you you know want to share your good fortune with society? Do you feel compelled to move the needle? You know, maybe on the climate change change issue or on food insecurity. Um, is there a particular issue that medical issue potentially that's impacted your family? Uh, are, do you have particular religious beliefs uh, that, that drive your philanthropy? And do you hope to leave a legacy for subsequent generations, but really getting to the point where you can articulate those motivations and goals for giving is, is fundamental to your, to your framework. The other thing is to really think about what, what are your long-term goals? You know, we always ask donors to, to complete a sentence. Um, I'll consider my philanthropy to be successful if fill in the blank. That'll help you, you know, really look down the road in terms of what it is that you're seeking to accomplish. Uh, I mentioned values a moment ago, and again, I think it's so important to articulate your values. So 
in many ways, values are the things that are sustained and really don't change. <laughs> they're, they're sort of the innate, what, what drives you as a person, as a family, what, what's in your heart, what's in your soul, um, what, what, has, what have been the guiding lights of, of your life? And those could be things like empathy or inclusion or family or learning or love, and the list goes on. But take some time to articulate those values. So we've got motivations and goals, what long-term success looks like, articulating your values. And then, of course, another very fundamental point is identifying the focus areas for your philanthropy. And this is a place where I think a lot of donors get tripped up. I think that um, many people start out with just wanting to do everything for everyone. And everything, every organization that they're interested in, in supporting because the need feels so great. And, and you want to touch as many people as you can or you want to respond to your family members' interests. And they might be very diverse. But what makes, I think, for, for very successful philanthropy is focused philanthropy. But it's always important also to maintain a discretionary bucket <laughs> that allows you to do some of that more responsive giving um, or sets aside some money for the next generation or those who aren't sitting on your giving committee or your board. Um, but, but you still need to really identify those priority areas that are going to be the focus of your philanthropy. And it doesn't have to be forever. You know, in your initial planning stage, identify two or three and dig deep, learn, glean some clarity about what the needs are uh, in those issue areas, in the communities that are struggling with them, uh, and really look at what some of the themes are from your previous giving. Again, I would say stay focused um, and you can really make an impact with focus. And most importantly, Todd, approach your philanthropy with humility. Those are those are great points, Betsy. And I've you know I've seen different different donors who have moved from strategies of more broad based giving to then you know rallying around a particular cause that's much more focused and tangible, and you can see the impact and get people excited about it, um, and it really it can bring new energy to to grant making and also have a potentially much bigger impact. Um, so. I think those are those are great. Those are great points. Um, one of the things that we when we were talking with Bet Betsy, when we and I were talking about this framework, uh, we were preparing for this webcast. Uh, one of the things we talked about is well, where should fund a charitable giving vehicle be if you're going to fund a vehicle? And we we sort of debated should it be in the understand your capital area or, or articulate your vision? And um, we you know. I think we, we thought ideally you would articulate your vision um, and then that would help you decide what vehicle is the right vehicle. But I think in reality, a lot of people um, understand their giving capital and fund it up front to foundation or donor advised fund or something else. And then they have some, it's good, important to have some idea of what you want to give, but um, you don't have all of the, all of the um, vision fleshed out. And as it relates to um, a, 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 fund, a charitable giving vehicle, there are a number of different vehicles that, that one can consider. Some of the most popular ones are clearly private foundations and donor advised funds, charitable remainder trusts, uh, charitable gift annuities. D donor advised funds, as, as you all know, have grown dramatically given their flexibility, low cost, and ability to serve the needs of a broad range of donors. Uh, in fact, 
from 2015 to 19, uh, contributions to donor advised funds grew 80%. And during the same time period, grants from donor advised funds increased 90%, over 90% actually, to 25 billion. So um, the people are really seeing the, the benefits of that. And that's one of the, the things that, that we offer at Fiduciary Trust Charitable. Uh, we also have some resources for those interested in learning more about the advantages and trade-offs of different charitable giving vehicles. Through our partners, Fiduciary Trust Charitable can provide our audience with access to all of these charitable giving vehicles. So why don't we move to the next step in the process, which uh, in the charitable giving uh, strategy process, which is defining the grant making strategy and process. You want to take us through that step? Absolutely, Todd. There are many ways to achieve impact in an issue area, but the starting point is to understand the field and what the needs are. I'd suggest that this is one of the most important steps in ensuring that you're going to make change effectively, or at least participate in change making. And the more you know, the better you're going to be able to be an effective philanthropic actor. One of the ways in which we help clients um, is by creating a landscape analysis. In landscape analysis, what we do is we explore the context of the issue that you're hoping to support, and then any recommendations from the field about how best to tackle the issues. The analysis also provides a number of organizations that align with the focus areas, the priority areas that you've identified. Once you understand the issue areas, um, and where you can best invest your charitable dollars, the next step is to put the pieces together to manage your charitable giving. And this includes developing giving guidelines that will summarize your priority areas and the strategies that you want to support. Also your geographic focus and the population you want to focus on and the types and size and range of grants that you're going to be providing. And then it's always good to share in your guidelines the timelines for your grant making. But, you know, I just want to emphasize how important general operating support is for nonprofits. It's the money that allows them to do their business and to keep the doors open and the lights on, and to acquire the professionals they need to run their programs and lead the organization. I know many donors are attracted to programs and projects because it feels more manageable, but think twice. Finally, determine how you're going to actually make your giving decisions. Uh, for private foundations and trusts, you have a board, but for a donor-advised fund, we recommend setting up a giving committee. Giving guidelines should be made available to the board and the giving committee to really help guide decision-making. That's where your focus areas are, your strategies, the types of grants you're going to make. And then think about how you're going to assess those funding opportunities that are before you. I mean, of course, there are going to be many more requests um, than you're able to support. But then you're in a position to take a vote to ensure that everyone's on the same page. Then I would just say process is as important as the work you're engaged in as a donor. So set policies to guide your given, giving decision making. I think it's important to know that donors don't have to go it alone. Getting professional support to learn about the field, to conduct landscape analyses, to develop strategies, and to actually develop your giving guidelines and implement your grant making can not only make this process more efficient and effective, but it offers an opportunity 
to partner with experts and to learn from them. Well, it's, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about the design of charitable giving process. I want to uh, change the gears now and just talk about implementing the grant process, uh, which has the three steps that I mentioned earlier. The first implementation step is evaluating and I, or really identifying and evaluating potential grant opportunities. Clearly, depending upon your mission and whether you're an individual or an organization making grant decisions, the approach will vary. But what are some of the key factors to consider at this stage, Betsy? Todd, as we discussed, the landscape analysis is really a way to understand the field and to source some opportunities that align with your interest. But that's not the end of the sentence. After that, you have to drill down further. You may choose to accept letters of intent or inquiry, as we call them. So you can review any number of opportunities that might be aligned with what you accomplish. And if you've been at it for a while, you'll learn about the organizations that your grantees are working with. But in any event, additional research is necessary. If there's an organization or organizations that you're particularly interested in, you need to find out more. You can meet with the organization, their development and program staff, and perhaps there are other funders or groups and organizations that focus on your issue areas. You can talk with them and swap strategies. Um, and I'd also say that, you know, exploring funding networks, grant making associations, and consider collaborating with other funders to maximize the impact of your dollars to leverage them. A final word on learning and curating opportunities. Over the last 18 months, and Todd mentioned this earlier with COVID, and the light that's been shown on racial and economic injustice. Remember as you're sourcing opportunities to learn about and identify organizations that are led by and working in traditionally underfunded communities. It's really up to us as funders to begin the, the stream of funding um, to meet the very critical needs of those communities. So the more you know, the more you can ensure that your gifts are focused, responsive, and they'll have impact. You'll often confront the fact that you have more organizations, as I mentioned earlier, to consider than your philanthropic budget can actually support. So be selective when you're soliciting proposals. You might get letters of inquiry, but be selective. When you choose a set of organizations from whom to solicit a proposal, it's not something we think about, but it sets expectations for a nonprofit if you're inviting them to submit a proposal. So it's, you know, that's just something I think for, for donors to keep in mind. But once you have a list of organizations that meet your funding criteria, you can go ahead and solicit those proposals. Make sure, of course, and this goes without saying, that you request financials, that you have information about their mission and their programs, their evaluation rubrics, and it's always good if they've conducted any previous evaluations to have them submit that. Uh, their annual reports, for example. But one thing to keep in mind is to really streamline your request and don't make it onerous. Some funders actually accept proposals that have been submitted to other funders for the same purposes. Um, so they, these nonprofits don't have to reinvent the wheel and take away from the very business that they're operating and that you want to support. I also suggest that many donors who are giving away upwards of a quarter million dollars a year, and that's if you have a private foundation 
or a trust, that many are availing themselves of grants management programs so that you can capture the data about your giving historically and on an annual basis. And it also provides an online portal for organizations to actually submit their proposals to you. And some grants management programs also allow for uh, board members, for example, to have a passcode to get in to be able to review proposals. So it makes it a, a sort of seamless um, place in which data and information is held. So the next stage uh, in conducting due diligence without getting too granular is to assess the organization's financials. You want to look at their budget, their financial statements in their 990s. Are there any red flags? And understand their sources of support. Um, who else is supporting this organization? Understand their board and their senior professionals. But remember, on paper, all of this due diligence only takes you so far. It's also about building a relationship of trust and open dialogue and cultivating a partnership. Think about how you're going to evaluate your efforts. One's internal, internal evaluation, and that's just this question you need to ask yourselves. Are you adhering to your mission and priorities? Is your board or committee engaged? Is your professional staff performing well? And are you staying on your toes? Um, are you making adjustments along the way, staying apprised of shifts in the fields of interest that you're working in? So that's the internal evaluation piece. And the other, of course, is uh, whether your grantee partners are performing well against their stated goals. You know, and for a funder, you have to think to yourself, you might require an annual report, but how are you using those annual reports, whether they're verbal or a written report to inform your own work? Oftentimes, they just sort of fall into the circular file. And I would say those are critical and, and provide critical information to really capture the impact of the contributions that you're making. But the question always becomes, what aspect of the change that your grantees are engaging in can you really attribute to your funding? So review your cumulative grants list and create an impact report so that on an annual basis or every couple of years you can see where have you created and facilitated change. And I think that we all have to be realistic that change takes time, that in one year we're not going to be able to end homelessness. I know that goes without, you know, saying, but it bears repeating and saying, and that's that patience is, is very critical. Well, clearly there are a lot of needs out there, Betsy, and uh, I think your thoughts on how do you figure out the right ones to focus on, which, which organizations to focus on, those are all uh, terrific, terrific insights. So, so you've identified the, the need, you've identified some organizations that you think would be a great fit. The next stage in the process is committing funding, and what are some of the things to think through in that process? Well... Some of it is, is, is really what uh, I mentioned earlier about situating the kind of grant that you're going to make um, and, and allowing organizations to uh, articulate what they need and therefore then what you will support. So I think part of it is also just being led by the nonprofits that you're considering and what their particular needs are. I mean, donors are only as effective as the nonprofits they support. Yeah, it's a marriage, you know, there we're, we're two pieces of two pieces of the puzzle. 
the, the sort of change-making pie that we need nonprofits who are operating effectively and we need effective donors. Um, so w what that means is to really listen to the field and, and allow nonprofits to articulate the kind of funding they need. I mean, most of the time they're going to say general operating support, no question. Um, but, but I do think there are times when, you know, again, you have to assess and right size your grant. So you're not going to make a million dollar contribution to a nonprofit, a small grassroots nonprofit that has a $2 million budget. The only thing I would say when you're thinking about um, how to situate your grant and the type of contribution to make, think about multi-year funding. It truly helps nonprofits um, plan. If they know that, that this funding is going to be coming into their budget over the course of the next two or three years, it allows them to plan for their organization, their program or project. So those are, those are great points, Betsy, about um, how to think about the, the giving and um, multi-year grants and so forth. At what point does it make sense to establish a letter of agreement or a memo of understanding if it's not something where you have legal control of the assets, um, at what size opportunity or what types of opportunities um, for giving should you be considering that? Well, I, you know, I would say that, uh, well, first of all, if you have a private foundation, I think everything should be documented. So even if you're making a $1,000 grant or a $1,500 grant, there should be a, a short grant or agreement. It's, it's almost a compliance issue. Um, but a more formal grant award agreement that requires reporting and has some additional elements tied to it, uh, I think that anything under ten to 20000 it really depends on what you know, your average grant size uh, are, um, really doesn't need all that, you know, significant formality. But I would also say that it's important for nonprofits and for donors to really understand each other's expectations and how you want to be communicated with and you know, we, we are in touch with a lot of donors who are dissatisfied with how nonprofits are communicating with them. Well, the problem there is, is it was never articulated nor agreed upon. So I, I think it's important to codify that in a letter. That's, that's uh, consistent with the way I was thinking about it as, as well, Betsy. And with the Donor Advised Fund, as you, as you know, um, but for our audience, you don't have legal control of the assets. You can't sign a commitment between the donor advised fund and a, and a charity, but uh, we've definitely worked with um, some of the, on the larger gift side, developing a, a, a sort of a, a memo of understanding of what is going to be happening when the, 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 the charitable advisor or donor um, is going to recommend grants over a multi-year cycle, as an example, for particular purposes. So uh, those are something that things that, that can definitely be done, even in a donor-advised fund context. Yeah, I, I would just add that um, it's important to have that memorandum of understanding. It really is. Um, and I think it speaks to the, the idea of transparency. No, donors that are super transparent um, make for better partners in the field, and um, it really helps nonprofits understand you, your personality, what your mission is, what you're seeking to accomplish, how you like to be engaged. Um, so to the extent you can be transparent in the form of a letter, an MOU, uh, or even with the smaller contributions on the private foundation side, uh, I think the more effective your partnerships are going to be. That's a great, great point. 
Well, let's uh, move on to the final implementation step, which is monitoring, adapting, and planning. What are some of the most effective ways you've seen grant makers review the ongoing impact of their grants? I think it's, it's so important to take time to reflect on your work. Um, and, and that involves recognizing that the world is rapidly changing, that the landscape um, is changing dramatically. Uh, as, for example, staying with the homelessness example as government funding has ebbed and flowed, uh, as, you know, there's been a, a dramatic economic ebb and flow, uh, people, you know, having trouble paying their rent and their mortgages and that sort of a, an ebb and flow. Um, we'll see homelessness increase over time and also see some new and innovative strategies that are being pursued. And of course, you want to seek conversations with your grantees. You want to receive reports from them. That could be a, a verbal report. It could be a, a check-in conversation twice a year, once a year. Uh, it could be a formal report. I would recommend that organizations should be given the opportunity to submit a report for a project or program that other funders are receiving as opposed to having to create a report for, you know, that's special for you. You know, again, we want to free up their time so that they can do the very work that, that we're supporting. So be sure to take the temperature of those that you're giving with. That's another piece of reflection. Uh, you want everybody to be engaged. Make sure they're learning together. Um, making sure that the next generation, if you have a family DAF or a family uh, private foundation or trust, that there's a plan for next generation engagement. So it doesn't just happen by inviting people to participate. You have to kind of figure out, so how are you going to invite them? What kind of learning opportunities are you going to provide the next generation? Or frankly, successor trustees, successor advisors need a roadmap. I mean, I, I have to say that it's very important for people to think about not just their lifetime giving, but to make a plan for what's going to happen in their estate plan and they're no longer here. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people as they've completed their estate plans, have placeholders. And I think once you have some experience under your belt, that's another piece of, of what you need to do is to plan for the future and revisit that um, over time. So stay current, join a philanthropy organization. Uh, their exponent philanthropy actually is... Uh, based in Washington, D.C., it's opportunities for donors to engage with one another, uh, and there's the Council on Foundations and any number of other places to uh, be engaged and learn. And again, I know I've been super redundant, but learn, learn, learn. <laughs> Those are great, great points, Betsy. You know, I, I would say on this whole monitor and adapt um, Part, part that we've been discussing, you know, on there's, the, there's the, the donor side and then there's the charity side. And I would say on the donor side, your points about um, thinking about the next generation and engaging them early is so important. And we, see, we definitely see donors doing that, getting their children involved in grant recommendations. Um, we also see, you know, after the matriarch and uh, patriarch are gone, um, and, then, and then sometimes either a foundation um, I'm definitely seen it's in a foundation. Um, the next generation may may be well intentioned in wanting to give, but the administration of managing all the things associated with a foundation is just they just don't have the time for it. And so um, we've seen you know converting to a donor advised fund or even multiple donor advised funds. It's not that siblings don't necessarily get along, but they have independent things they'd like to give to, and it's just a, 
it's a more effective and uh, way to, to give um, uh, than the than the foundation structure. And then some people stay in the foundation that works multi gen well too. So it really does uh, it really does does depend on the donor. So that covers the key steps in the process of designing and implementing a charitable giving strategy. Clearly, different grant makers have a variety of needs with respect to this process. And we've created some resources that our audience may find useful as they move through the process. And they include the giving strategy approach framework, so the six different elements we just talked through. Um, a mission statement template can help you develop a mission statement for, um, for your giving. And then also regional grant making association contact information. So as Betsy mentioned earlier, they have grant making templates and other kinds of resources that can be really helpful as you are setting up your grant making process. And you can access these materials at uh, fidtrustco.com forward slash grant dash resources. In some cases, you may be able to go through these steps yourself or within your own organization. In other situations, you may benefit from a philanthropic consultant such as strategic philanthropy to help you with the charitable giving process. So, um, well, that, that covers the topics we have for today. As I said, thanks again, Betsy, for joining. It's been wonderful hearing your thoughts, um, your firm's uh, insights and your insights based on your extensive experience were really valuable to me and I'm, I'm sure to our audience. I'd also like to express appreciation to our audience for joining today. We hope you found the discussion useful. Thanks again for joining. The opinions expressed in this material are as of the date issued and subject to change at any time. The materials discuss general market conditions and trends and should not be construed as investment advice. Nothing contained herein is intended to constitute investment, legal, tax, or accounting advice, and viewers should discuss any proposed arrangement or transaction with their investment, legal, or tax advisors. Copyright 2021, Fiduciary Trust Company, and Strategic Philanthropy Limited.